Good afternoon. Good morning for some people on the West Coast, but it's great to have you. We're super excited for this talk today. Um, I'm going to throw it right over to our one of our co-founders, Jeff. All right. Awesome. So really excited for today's talk with Mike Irwin. I think just about everyone on this call knows him, but for those who don't, he is the co-founder of the Positivity Project. He is also the founder and CEO of Team Red, White, and Blue, a veteran service organization. He's a 13-year active duty veteran with three combat tours and is currently a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves. And today he's going to be talking about one of his two books. This one is Leadership is a Relationship, How to Put People First in a Digital World. And today, with everything that we've got going on, all the connectivity, I think this is vitally important for all of us to understand. So with that, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, great to see some familiar faces. And I know a lot of people are just kind of like listening on, uh, on mute, just listening in, but uh, so great to be here. So uh, in the sake of time, let's just jump right in. Uh, as those of you who have been to one of my trainings before um, or heard me speak, you know that I talk fast and I talk uh, a lot. And I, and I come uh, in this case here with a lot of ideas in, in quick succession. So uh, if you have the capacity to kind of like laser focus and dial in, I think that would be helpful. Um, you know, if you're you know, kind of partially paying attention, it'll be hard because I'm going to move pretty fast through some of these ideas. But I guess that's why we have the recording for some of you that are, that are multitasking. But uh, great to see everyone. And uh, I'm going to start sharing my, my slides here in, in driving. All right. So I want to start off with a phrase, and it's in some regard fitting. I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of what's happening in the world right now in Ukraine. Uh, but this, this term, this phrase of VUCA, is something that came about in the U.S. Army War College way back in 1987, um, and and it's and some of you have heard me speak on this before, especially like uh, right after COVID started. I think in April and in May of 2020, uh, I gave a talk, you know, virtually, you know, to about 75 educators from the P2. Um, but if you have not heard this phrase before, I would encourage you to not just be aware of it, but also consider using it in your own life as you think about how to talk to the people that you lead and that you love about the seemingly unending sense of volatility, volatility and stress and chaos in life. And so this really here summarizes from the military's point of view, essentially the fog of war, right? There's a lot of things that you can't predict that are outside your control. And when that happens, it creates in, in many instances, a real sense of internal duress, right? That a lot of us feel. So, so why do I kick off with that on, on, a, on a discussion around a book that's called Leadership is a Relationship? Well, I want to start off by making, uh, I think, a really important point that we all know that leadership matters. Leadership is important. Uh, the data bears this out very clearly. Leaders are responsible for taking care of people, for getting things done. Leaders are responsible for developing people. There's so many things that leaders are responsible for. But I think it's important to note that leadership is especially important in a VUCA environment, right? So in other words, if the sun's shining and the wind's at your back, leadership matters. But the reality is you can have um, kind of lackluster leadership and that ship is still going to generally sail down you know, a, a relatively steady path. When there's volatility, all bets are off. And the level and the quality of leadership is uh, drastically more important in periods of volatility. Why? Primarily because people in those moments when they're stressed and when they're worried, they're looking to their leaders. They're looking to leaders and people who are making the decisions in, the, uh, in their life uh, to help guide them and to help them to navigate through those hard times. All right. So before we talk about leadership, just a couple of, of slides to kind of share ideas before we really get into the, you know, the content. Um, first, I want, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the content of the first book. Um, and then how it sets up and it sets the table for the second book, right? So first of all, like we've all heard the word leadership. We hear it a lot. Uh, we work for leaders. We develop other people. Like it's in our personal life, our professional life, our volunteer life. But ultimately there's this concept uh, very often in life where we don't get a common operating picture or we don't get an operational definition of a word. So when you're using it and I'm using it, it actually means something sometimes very, very uh, different. So when it comes to leadership, and this is what I, what, uh, what I studied in grad school at the University of Michigan under the umbrella of positive psychology, I studied leadership and how can positive psychology help us to better understand how to lead and what leadership is. 
I, I found it very fascinating that way back in 1978, a year before I was born, James McGregor Burns had this to say about leadership. It is one of the most observed yet least understood phenomenon on earth. Uh, and, I've been, and I've been sharing this quote for about the past 10 years, ever since I first came across it in my literature review you know, in my paper. Right? We all talk about it, we think about it, but actually how well do we understand what leadership is? In fact, academic leadership scholars have defined leadership in over 200 different ways. Right? That sends a signal that some people look at it through this lens, other look at it through that lens. And so it is really hard to get a common understanding of what leadership is. And I'm not here today to tell you what I, exactly what I think leadership is. I will share you know, um, a couple of thoughts on that. But the bottom line is that leadership, once again, looks very different. Uh, and I just put a couple of the examples here, right? Are you leading people who are motivated, who are fired up, who are like chomping at the bit, right? Every single day, or are you leading people who are not motivated, right? Um, you know, and who are just really uh, in search of and need someone to inspire them and make them better. Right. Uh, I actually just heard you know, a conversation, a podcast on this yesterday. There is a big difference between like inspiring the unmotivated and in harnessing the power of those that are already motivated. Right. Um, and it requires very different things. And, and I've seen this at the highest level of professional sports and elite military units and elite businesses and in, in hard charging schools. Right. You start to talk to people who are already there. They've had to commit so much to get there. Um, there is just a different level uh, of leadership that is required than if you're talking, and I made a post about this on Facebook a few weeks ago, but when I was at the DMV, and boy, was I frustrated, right? You know, um, and like did not feel like a sense of motivation from the people who were trying, you know, to help me to, you know, to get my license squared away, right? And then the idea of success versus adversity. Uh, are you leading an environment where, where you're succeeding and you're winning and things are going well? And again, the, the wind is at your back, or are you climbing uphill? Are you sailing um, you know, in, into some headwinds. And so I think it's really important to know that we, one leader, you might be the exact same person in one environment, you're doing a tremendous job at leadership in an entirely different environment, you struggle, right? And we see this often where, you know, sometimes like uh, in your personal life, you might be struggling like with, you know, you know, leading your family, leading your kids, but then in your day job, things are going well or vice versa. Things are struggling on one front, you know, and going well somewhere else, right? The situation really matters. So what is leadership from, from my vantage point? Um, it's really just, you know, not just my vantage point, but uh, it's the perspective of president slash general Eisenhower. It's the art of getting someone else to do something that you want done because they want to do it. In both books, it's really how we have defined leadership and lead yourself first and leadership as a relationship, right? And so I think it's really important to know, like when you, when you look at this definition, it's, this is not like the rubber stamp answer, double underline, here you go. But it is, it is uh, you know, I think a, a very interesting perspective that helps us to understand that leadership is not just about positions of authority or rank or tenure at a location. Leadership is really something bigger than that. And it, in fact, is more accessible to people than I think a lot of people realize, right? And that's a conclusion I've drawn uh, by having this conversation with a lot of people over the past five to seven years um, in researching these books. Right. Number one, it's an art, not a science. Uh, in a world obsessed with algorithms and obsessed with data and like, like, hey, how can we program this? Um, it, you know, leadership is an art. Right. Number two, it's not about you doing the work. Uh, yes, leaders do need to set the example. Do as I do, not as I say. However, like, it is ultimately about getting other people to grab an oar and to row alongside with you or to row in synchronization with each other. Number three, it's about something that needs to be done, something that you as the, as the person in a leadership um, role want to see other people do. And sometimes that's just giving best effort. Sometimes that's you know, building a stronger culture. Um, whatever it is, it's really about getting other people to do what needs to be done. And then lastly, it's not because they have to, but because they want to. Uh, Jim Collins talked about this idea that leadership in its purest form exists when people follow and they don't have to. I build on that and say something similar. It is impossible for you to compel 100% effort from someone. Not possible, right? I guess short of like, you know, having a gun to their head. Like you cannot compel people to give their very best. Simon Sinek has you know, famously said, like there's two ways you, you change behavior. You manipulate it or you inspire it, right? And so part of a role of a leader, whether you're this like, you know, chest pumping, like, like, yes, I'm an inspirational leader. I'm going to give you a pep talk kind of person, or you're a more quiet leader. 
right? And you do so through your one-on-one -on -one conversations and your resolve. It doesn't matter, but somehow leadership transcends this idea of, well, I'm in charge. So I said, you got to do this, right? And if you don't, you're in trouble. Um, that's, that's really not leadership. That's flexing power. Leadership is about inspiring people to give their best, right? And because of that, and because it's not necessarily about the position, it means that leadership is, is really accessible to just about everybody. Does that mean that everyone's a leader? No. Does that mean that everyone should be like a leader? No. Does it mean though, however, that every single person at moments and in, and in chapters of their life are needed to lead, that are needed to inspire other people to get them to do the hard work or what needs to be done? Absolutely, right? And that's where I land on this. Okay, so when you start thinking about the information age, um, and, and I'm just going to just, we define it really as about 2005, give or take, 17 years ago, maybe it's 2003, right? But it's, it's on the heel of the dot-com burst. It's on the heel of Y2K. For those of you old enough to remember all that, like, ah, the computers are going to crash, right? When we go to the new millennium. Um, but like, let's just say about 15 to 20 years ago, the information age, if you were to stop and take a snapshot of your day-to-day -day life right now in 2022 and compare it side by side, if you were doing the exact same job, right? 20 years ago, think of how, and you were to like make a list of this is my daily routine. This is what my day looks like. This is what my communications look like. These are my sources of stress. And you were to stack those lists side by side for most people, especially how they spend the majority of their time like the gap is enormous. Okay. So why is that? How we consume information has changed drastically, right? When did, you know, when, did, how did you get information back then? The newspaper, magazines, you know, letters in the mail, and then you would get like your news, um, you know, like usually in like these windows of time, right? Like 6.30 in the morning, like noon, uh, 5.30 to 6.30 at night. And if you stayed up later, so you, you had limited periods of time where you got your information. That directly impacts what you think, how we initiate and start and maintain relationships, how we communicate, how we do things like shop and travel and, and take taxis, now Ubers or Lyfts, right? How we spend our time. Because not only do we live in the information age, we live in the entertainment age, right? Where we have a ubiquitous amount of entertainment and distractions around us at our fingertips, right? From all the streaming services, the Hulus, the Netflix, the ESPN.coms, the news sources, like all of that is right there at our fingertips, right? When, on our phone or, or on our laptop, um, on our computer, on our television. They, they just, we, we swim in a sea of information, right? And then lastly is how do we lead, right? Like, therefore, have we given much thought to how a person needs to lead differently in the world today versus 15 or 20 years ago? And my conclusion on that is that a lot of people have not really given much thought um, they've given some thought, but, but not enough to what are the changes that I need to make as a leader to be able to lead effectively in the world today in the information age than 15 or 20 years ago. So in response to thoughts about all the ways that like, we live our life and that we lead in the information age, I've got really what I consider to be a two-part framework that exists in two books that I've co-authored. Um, right? Jeff's my co-founder of the P2. Ray was my co-founder, you know, co-author in the book. Willis, like I, I, I kind of say I co-everything. Like uh, I'm a big believer that life is a team sport, uh, that you get very little done on your own. Uh, and when you look at, you know, like these books, like these have been team efforts, right? The first book, I was the younger guy by a decade. The second book, I was the older guy by a decade, right? Um, and so having different perspectives and having different character strengths, stuff that we talk about in the P2 so much, um, has really helped, I think, both books uh, to bring unique perspective uh, to the reader. So just a real quick word about, and I, I just want to tie this in and, and really set the table for the rest of the conversation on leadership as a relationship, and then really have time, you know, in this small group setting to, to take questions and hear what's on your mind. But one of the big ideas in the first book, which started writing in 2010 and was published not until 2017, is this concept that you know, we hear a lot about in the military, that slow is smooth, smooth is fast, especially in times of chaos, especially in combat, right? And that anytime you rush and you try to go too fast, right, that you, that you set yourself up for making mistakes, right? And that actually, if you wanna get farther, that when you, like you, when you slow down, it allows you to be smooth and that smooth allows you to be faster. But ultimately, the big conclusion of lead yourself first is that we feel this pressure to do more, to go faster, to, to push the gas pedal down. And ultimately, that's not what leadership demands. 
right? That's maybe what like, you know, checking things off your, you know, to-do list, you know, demands, but ultimately leadership involves lots of those other things like inspiration and strategy and decision-making and relationship building and these things that can't be rushed. They can't be shoehorned. And so ultimately leadership demands that we spend some time in our day-to-day -day life, restraining ourselves, slowing down, focusing, analyzing, and reflecting, right? And, and if you don't make time in the given day to do those things, it will catch up to you inevitably in the form of burnout, in the form of making bad decisions, right? Uh, in the form of uh, losing people because they're no longer inspired by the mission. So it requires a lot of thought, right? And that was the big, you know, big message from the first book, All right? So there's my first breath, All right? That right there is all just some context and background and thinking around uh, leadership, around the information age, and around the first book. Because I've been on a lot of podcasts lately, and that question inevitably comes up. Well, what's the connection between a book about solitude and a book about relationships? That doesn't seem to make sense. Can you, can you build a bridge for me, right, to help me understand, like, why Lead Yourself First actually came first, and now the second book, right, followed it? Okay, so let's just talk about a couple of things, some of them that you already know as people who are involved in the mission of the Positivity Project, right? Number one, relationships, number one driver of life satisfaction. Full stop. Where do we spend a lot of our time in life? At work, with people that, you know, we're working on, on a common mission with, be it in your schools or in your volunteer organizations or in your family. If relationships are not strong, where you spend a lot of your time, you are not going to have a very high life satisfaction. If you go into and you can't stand the people you work with, if you can't stand, stand spending time in the you know, with, with your family or in your organizations that you volunteer with, your church, your volunteer group, your Habitat for Humanity, right? right? That, is, that is tough. That is tough to be happy and fulfilled if you don't have quality relationships with the people that you do life with, right? Second big idea, strategic you know, conversation here. Um, there is a lot of conversation and I'm going to conclude my, my thoughts, you know, with this. Um, but I want to tee it up right now. There is a lot of things as you've heard about in the P2 100 training dating back to 2016, you know, Jeff came up with this brilliant slide of like the world at 2030. Um, and I remember being like, man, that sounds really far. Is that going to resonate with people? And sure enough, first time I pressure tested, it was like, yup, that resonates. Cause even though it was way out there, people started to say, wow, yes, yeah, things are changing technology. It's real automation. It's real. Well, guess what? In the past couple of years, right? Technology has accelerated its impact on society. Um, a lot of things, a lot of professions, a lot of parts of our life are at risk for automation. If we had like a, a you know a, a crystal ball we could look into or the magic eight ball, right? Um, like you can try to forecast what they're going to be. As I like to say all the time, I joke and say, well, if it was that easy, we all would have invested, you know, $5,000 in Amazon in 1998 and be millionaires. Like you can't predict the future, right? You can try to forecast it. You can try to see around corners and all that. But ultimately what we know is that management in some regards can be over time through AI, I think, um, you, know, to, you know, be start to be, uh, you know, automated a little bit. Leadership is high and relationships are highly resistant to automation. And this is a really, really important idea because when you look at the people who are doing the research and doing the forecasting into the future about what are the jobs of 2030? What are the jobs that if you're teaching a fourth grader right now that they're, that are, that they're gonna be qualified to do? A lot of them talk about the soft skills, the people skills, the human skills, right? Leadership and influence and inspiration and taking care of people fall under that umbrella, right? That are very highly uh, resistant to automation. Leadership is absolutely one of those things, right? Um, and final point here is that the more chaotic, the more stressful life gets, the more important leadership gets, the more important relationships get, especially with those that we lead. And I've already talked about the VUCA environment and some of the, you know, some of the content around there, but like the more important like relationships and leadership become, uh, or they become more important as life gets more chaotic in that VUCA environment, right? Which uh, I, I, I see no signs of, uh, of that abating anytime soon. Um, and, and so I think that to me, a, a final big idea here to share is that, you know, through the volatility of life, leadership and relationships are both more important than ever. 
All right. So what, what do I mean when I say relationships? And again, you've seen this, you know, often through, you know, the P, you know, perhaps the P2 videos, the P2 training, but when you think about giving an operational dif, uh, definition to relationships, well, well, what are they? Right. And I love going to the dictionary um, to help simplify these things, right? But relationships are the way in which two or more people or groups of people, uh, and, and you can really boil this down to how do they think about, talk to, and treat one another, right? Really, how do, how do I think about you and how do I treat you, right? And so it's a, it, relationships are a series of ongoing bi-directional interactions that occur between people. So again, if you see someone and you sit next to them on the bus or at a sporting event and you never see them again, you might've been high-fiving them, you know, when the, you know, your team is winning or scoring touchdowns but there's no relationship there because there's nothing that's ongoing. So it's something about an ongoing set of interactions that occur. And so therefore, if you want to be good at relationships, then all you really need to do is be good at how you think about and how you treat people, right? If you really boil it down to that, okay? So then the big question is, whoa, 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 not so fast. Like, why is this way, way easier said than done, right? Way easier. So number one, people are complex. Uh, I was interviewed yesterday for a piece in my local newspaper and it said, fill in the blank, life is. I thought for a minute, I was like, man, first of all, I have no one's asked me that question in a long time. I said, life is complicated, right? Life is people and people are complicated. They got different experiences, different opinions, different belief systems. Um, they've got different backgrounds, uh, different desires and interests. And that's just two people. Now take that and stack that up at the community level or in, or in your school or even in your family, right? And, and try to lay, layer all that together, right? People are complex. Relationships are people. Life is people. I say this all the time. Life is a team sport. And just as a couple of examples, I'm talking like genetically we're different, how we're raised is different, personality traits, um, how we communicate, how we hate to communicate, love to communicate, our past experiences, good, bad, and in between. Uh, things that we're insecure about, things that we're highly confident about, what season of life are you in, right? Are you recently married? Are you divorced? Are your kids young and they're not sleeping through the night and getting sick? Are they um, older and they're out of the house? Um, you know, are you in a new, a new location or, you know, uh, you know, where do your parents, there's, the list goes on, right? About the season of life. Are you a caretaker for a parent or for someone who's sick in your family, right? And then lastly, it's just this idea of our mood. You, know, you can hold all those other things constant if you have not had enough uh, sleep, if you're up in the morning and you haven't had your caffeine yet, if you're hungry, um, if you've had two glasses of wine, um, like our, our mood has a huge impact. Our feelings in the moment have a huge impact on how we interact with people, the energy that we bring, right? And so like these are all factors that help to explain the complexity of life and how complicated it is. Number two, no shortcuts. Right, relationships. Uh, like we as we as especially as Americans love shortcuts. Hey, how can I get a short? How can I get a life hack? You know, can I get a hack on how to do this better? Right. You see all these articles, like all the search engine optimization. It's around hacks and shortcuts and trip. You know, tricks and trip and and, and tips on how to do things better. Um, the reality is, like a lot of things in life, there is no easier way. Right. There's no around. There's only through relationships are a they're only through kind of thing. Um, are there some exceptions to that? Sure. If you've been through a really stressful or traumatic experience with someone, like that might be a shortcut. Um, examples like go to war with someone, um, you know, things like that. You experience like you come upon an accident together, uh, you know, uh, with this total stranger and you save someone's life. Yeah, there are some things right there that might uh, qualify for like, hey, we forged a strong relationship through that shared suffering or that shared adversity. Um, but for the most part, they, re, they, relationship building requires time, paying attention to other people, <laughs> like listening actively, having like meaningful dialogue, um, being there for people on their tough days. We're getting into a lot of other people mindset stuff here, like paying attention to other people, being there for them on their tough days. And then there's this other idea down here around credit versus blame in a relationship, uh, be it a romantic relationship, friends, you know, at work, like who gets credit when things go right and who gets the blame when they go wrong, right? All these things shape and affect and influence our capacity to build relationships. And then lastly, this comes back to the point around the information age. We are busier and we are more distracted than ever. 
I know very few people who disagree with this, but you know, this statement here, there are a few, there's a few people who say, ah, I, I've cut this out of my life and this and that I don't have kids. I know some people down here outside Fort Bragg, they don't have TVs in their house, Shh, no TVs, right? Like there's certain people out there that don't have smartphones. They've got like those, like, you know, whatever, like I think they're called light phones or something like that. Like you can text and you can talk and that's really it. They're like, right. I know some people who have the discipline like Cal Newport, right? The author of digital minimalism that doesn't have email on his phone. It's like, why do I need email on my phone? I can do it when I'm in front of a computer. And if it's that important, someone's going to call me. Yeah. Um, but for most, for most of us, we are busier and we are more distracted than ever. And, and that is a problem. Point number three is a problem because point number two is a reality. There are no shortcuts in relationships in our personal life and in our professional life, especially in our leadership life, require time, require time and energy. And when we're busier and more distracted than ever, that makes it very difficult to build strong relationships. So the rest of the, the whole purpose of this book is really centered around like this idea of trying to convince people why relationships within an organization are vital to its success. In other words, because relationships are hard, because they take time, right? Because people are complicated and because it requires effort in being there for people. Because of all that, like there's gotta be a damn good reason for why it's worth the effort, the time, the stress to build stronger relationships within your organization. Because if there isn't, if you can't answer yes to this question, right? Or if you say, well, I don't know why relationships within an organization are that important. Right, then you certainly are not going to prioritize building stronger relationships within your team, within your organization. Right, so you have to believe that it's worth the effort to do this. And so that, that really becomes this big question of like, well, why are they so important? As I jokingly say, right, this is not about sitting around the campfire and singing kumbaya, right? Like that's, that's not what this is about. This is not like, oh, hey, like, like let's just sit here and, and just kind of all like sing and pretend that we don't have problems and we don't have challenges, right? So here's the list and here's how the book essentially breaks down, just giving you like a bit of a snapshot into, you know, into the insight because the book is nothing but a bunch of stories, right? With some analysis in there about how these things stitch together. But what we found by interviewing people, and again, we didn't go do research. We didn't run people through lab studies. We didn't cite tons of psychological journal articles. This is really like, uh, what can we learn qualitatively by interviewing people to hear their story about the role that relationships play in their life? And what we found is that positive relationships, especially in positions of leadership, fuel trust, the ability to hold people accountable in a positive and productive way, setting the condition, setting the table to forgive because inevitably in every relationship, people make mistakes, right? Uh, the ability to be resilient in the face of adversity, in the face of stress, whether it's that you miss your quarterly profit goal or your students don't uh, you know, achieve the outcomes that you, that you hope for them that you wanted to, like whatever the setback might be that there's you know, someone in the community, one of your teachers has cancer, like all the things that can go wrong in life, ultimately strong relationships allow people to lock arms with each other, right? They allow you to be resistant to so much of the, the negative effects of stress. Right? And then lastly is loyalty and stability, right? Work to be very clear. Like I've heard this over and over again, because I also have the opportunity to work with lots of companies like PwC and NetApp and Seattle Genetics. And work has become more and more transactional for people over the past 10 to 15 years, right? And so as you think about competitive advantages, to the best of your ability, if you can make work and doing work together relational, where people know about one another, care about one another, build relationships with each other. That's how you set the stage for increased stability within your organization and loyalty to one another. In other words, uh, I'm not gonna go take another job somewhere else for an extra, let's just say 10%, right? Of what I make on my salary, because to do so, I'm taking a risk to go work for somebody and with people that I don't know. And I really like working with this group of people right here. Okay, but guess what? If I don't really like these people here, if there are no relationships, if I feel my leader or my manager, my principal, my assistant, like whoever doesn't really care, well, if another opportunity comes along, what's gonna prevent me from jumping ship, right? And rolling off and going somewhere else. So loyalty and stability we found were, were fascinating things, that, the topics that came up, that leaders that invest in relationships develop a sense of loyalty, right? From the people that they lead, that, is, that, is, that money can't buy. Right. Um, and then lastly, is that again, that stability piece when you have loyalty, when you've got people who've been around and this is not saying that, that, that you should have no turnover, turnover is healthy, 
but it should be a, at a very calculated, moderate pace that when you've got good loyalty amongst the people you lead, you therefore have stability. And that even when they do move and they do move on, they don't give you the, the 14 day notice or the tell you at the end of June, hey, I'm out for next year, right? When I could have told you back in January, right? That sense of loyalty is like, I wanna make sure that I give you the best possible, you know, heads up for, for my future. All right, so a couple, final couple of slides here. And we'll get into some, uh, hopefully some Q&A. A list of thoughts and ideas that I share with people around strengthening relationships. All of these, to a certain extent, are research backed, um, but I think they're really more about trying to like bring the. This is more about trying to bring these ideas, um, you know, into life, right? For you know, for you. So number one, we know this in the P two. Words matter. So telling someone to to show humility versus stop bragging, uh, to show enthusiasm versus stop being so boring, right? Like using positive language affirms and it builds up relationships versus negative relationship uh, versus you know, negative approaches to words. It's not saying that there's, that there's never a time when you, you, when you can't or shouldn't use those negative, you know, or, 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 you know, other words and tell people, Hey, stop. Like there's a danger. Like you got to stop doing, you stop doing that right now. But for the most part, using positive language is really important. Number two, some of you know, the work of Brene Brown, but this concept of vulnerability, it really rose to power, you know, with her in 2009, 10 and 11. To build relationships, it certainly helps to make sure that people know, especially the people that you lead, know that you're human, right? And that they know that you are willing to share some of your humanity and some of your mistakes that you've made with them. Um, three, this has been difficult over the past couple of years, depending on you know, your, you know, your organizations and where you live, and, but as much in person as possible. Um, obviously, we're doing this presentation here, right, by Zoom. Technology allows us to do some pretty cool things that we otherwise couldn't do, because otherwise I couldn't be, like, in all these different locations in Somerset, Ohio, and New York, and out in, you know, California. Like, you, you couldn't be all these places, right? So technology is great, but as you think about relationship building, really trying to prioritize your in-person time to the best of your ability. Fourth idea, this is uh, kind of like relationship building one-on-one stuff. Right? But praise in public, criticize in private. Um, and this includes on the social media uh, space, right? Anytime you put something out there publicly and you criticize, whether it be on Facebook or a Facebook page, or it be, you know, um, something that, you know, other people see, right? That, that changes people's reaction to it. And it changes your capacity to be able to build relationships with people, right? When you criticize them in private, um, it changes the game, right? Because now it's constructive. Now it's proactive and it's like, hey, I'm giving you some feedback about what I think you can do better, but putting people on blast out in front of people, generally not a good idea, right? And certainly not something that helps to build relationships. All right, um, a, bit, a bit of a unique idea here. Think about how you can donate to a person's cause, support their business, whatever it might be. Um, these are some simple things like Jeff and I know a guy, you know, named Joe Quinn who went to West Point with him. I just bought nine packs of his hot dogs. Right. Like just doing simple, like he, cause he's the CEO of a hot dog company. Now. So like you think about ways that you can support your friends and in, in, in then in your personal and in your professional life as well. What can you do like to support your teachers, you know, to support your fellow teachers, um, to support people in your life, um, thinking about how can you support, you know, what they do on the side or their, their nonprofit organizations that they volunteer for and care so much about, right. That is relationship building stuff. I still remember from 12 years ago, those first people who donated to Team Red, White, and Blue back in 2010, <coughs> right? Uh, we all know about this, working to be present with people. We heard over and over again, the biggest challenge to me building relationships with the people I lead is that I'm distracted, right? <clears throat> so like simple things that I talk about, you know, a lot much easier said than done, but on Zoom, like I'm a big, like, you know, my new thing is I got a baseball because it's coming into baseball season, right? But like, like stepping back and showing people you got your hands up because guess what? I'll just say the obvious that, you, that everyone knows and kind of smirks about, but for some reason, people don't want to say it out loud. Like if I can't see your hands, I'm assuming that you're shopping on Amazon or you're surfing ESPN.com or you're doing something else, right? Like I just, you know, so I encourage people all the time, not all the time to have your hands up invisible, but like I do a thing like where I definitely like indicate to people, no, 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 I'm not being distracted right now because we all know you're no more than like, you know, two inches away from typing in something on, your, uh, on the internet uh, and then you see this show up when someone will tell a joke, like on a, on, you know, a conversation and like, and then you'll just sit there and be like, hello, did anyone, like, why did only three of you laugh? <laughs> right. Right. Like it's because people weren't even paying attention. Like they're there and they've got another article up. They don't even have the screen up, you know? And so like some of this is like zoom funny, like haha stuff, but it's, it is at a deeper level of problematic um, because 
like people don't feel that you're present with them. And that can show up in the form of like a Zoom or it can show up in the form of like uh, when you go out to dinner and you know, my wife and I went out to dinner last night, celebrated our, you know, a little belated our, our anniversary and like you leave phones in the car, right? So how can you separate yourself from the devices and the distractions? Um, the window in the mirror, credit and blame. I already said a little bit about this before, but like uh, my favorite battalion commander would say like, hey, when things go right, look out the window. When things go wrong, look in the mirror, right? Very often we got the opposite going on. We do, we've got blame shifting, right? Which is like, when things go right, Hey, pat, you know, who can you know pat me on the back? And when things go wrong, I'm gonna look out. The, I'm gonna look out the window, and, and who can who can share some of the blame with me here, right? One of the the strongest things that you can do as a leader, but especially like uh, you know, especially as a leader, but really just in general from a relationship building standpoint, is to accept responsibility when things go wrong. Um, and this is not easy to do. For some of us, it's 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 harder than others. This is not easy for me. I struggle with this, but like accepting your part of what went wrong. Um, and when you do that, it really helps to draw you closer to other people. Uh, there's a whole book on this idea, number eight, it's called A More Beautiful Question by Warren Berger. Um, asking good questions drives meaningful conversation. Uh, and so often what we see is that people ask uh, kind of like lackluster, very blase questions like, hey, so how was your day? Hey, how's the weather? Um, you know, and you just kind of ask these very vague questions. Um, and once in a while, someone will take the bait and they'll go, hey, oh, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to, and they tell you all about all the things, good, bad, and ugly. Um, most of the time, a, a lazy question gets a lackluster response. So if you want to get to know people deeper, you want to really build that relationship, especially as a leader, the suggestion is get really good at asking specific questions. Can you tell me about a time when you really experienced conflict and emerged stronger from it? right? Can you tell me about a situation when you were really uncomfortable and really afraid, but you moved through that fear and you grew stronger? Like, how can you ask like more specific questions to help drive like a richer, deeper, more meaningful conversation, right? Because ultimately that is necessary for us to get to know each other better, right? Uh, the power of meals. Uh, there's something about walking or running uh, with people uh, and with breaking bread, sharing a meal. Uh, I've done it a lot over the past couple of weeks myself um, with, with three or four different people. Um, meals are powerful. Uh, I don't know what it is. It's just maybe it kind of like a, we put our guard down a little bit, like we're willing, you know, uh, to open up in our conversation more. It fosters a sense of like meaning, what I would call meaningful vulnerability. Um, and you can have harder conversations more productively than if you feel like you're in this adversarial thing of like, if it's just you and me on a Zoom, right? Or if it's, you're sitting across the desk from me, that just feels like, ah, there's this space between us, right? But there's something about coming together and sharing a meal that, that really helps, especially from a leadership standpoint. So I encourage leaders all the time, take somebody that you lead out to lunch, right? Bring them out, go grab lunch, sit down and just talk, right? And, and you might have like five minutes worth of work stuff to talk about, but just have a conversation about life, right? About what your dream job, like, you know, is this your dream job or what do you want to do? Like, what would be the perfect job in the world for you? How can I help you get there? Right? Those kinds of conversations are super powerful, right? And they help to strengthen relationships, especially between leaders and the people uh, that they lead. And then lastly is expectation management. I, I see this over and over again. Um, like when there is a mismanagement of what people expect in a relationship, it just, it, it's, it's really hard to build a strong relationship there. Um, you know, I just use the example of like, uh, oh, we're going to Disney World. My family goes to Disney World, like every couple of years, like my whole family, we all come together like, and you think, oh, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be the most magical time. And then you get into it. Then you get into traffic in, in Georgia, right? And you're stuck and parked on I-95. And then, you know, people gotta go to the bathroom and you, and you gotta get off to like, and people gotta pee on the side of the road. I mean, the list goes on, right? Like there's, you have this idea in your head of what it's supposed to be like. And then that comes slamming into reality um, with, what, with like what actually happens. And now there's this friction there because you had in your mind that this is what I was expecting. And this is actually what happens. And so the point here, when it comes down to strengthening relationships, it's really important to have that conversation with people like about uh, the expectations. This is what you can expect from me. And this is what um, I can expect from you. All right, last slide and last thoughts here. I'll, I'll kind of end on a perhaps conference, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a, little bit of a, a little bit of a friction here to kind of tee up some of the conversations here. But you know, there, uh, as you probably have heard, has been a lot of conversation 
um, around the metaverse. Uh, you know, Facebook, of course, renamed itself Meta. I think they paid like $80 million for the name or something like that to give you an idea about just how valuable they think this is. Um, but there's, there's a lot. There's a lot of unknown things here on the horizon that, that I think we have to, to really grapple with. Um, and, and I'm trying to, through this book and through talks that I have, I am trying to create a sense of urgency within people to know that while we don't know exactly what the future looks like, that while we don't know what the quote unquote metaverse looks like, um, we've got enough of a sample size in the game Fortnite that people, uh, mostly young men, have spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars on accessories in a virtual world. So buy $2 to buy a pair of shoes that your virtual character can wear. Right. Um, and I'm not, I'm not here to, you know, you know, it's right up the road for me and carry 45 minutes away. I'm not sitting here and saying like that, like these are inherently bad, but what I'm here to say is like, we should be very cautious, very vigilant uh, about the, the, the future of the world uh, and the future of how we interact in person and we do things IRL, right. If you're not tracking that in real life, I learned that one about a year ago um, versus virtual versus a metaverse world. Um, do I think there's some amazing things that can happen in the metaverse? Absolutely, right? Um, like my daughter fell, has a hairline fracture in her skull a few, you know, like a week ago, um, had to go up to UNC hospital, um, five and a half hours to wait to see like a pediatric neurologist, like really could have like looked at the CAT scans and saved all, there's a lot of like efficiencies that can be gained in life that technology and, and a more virtual, more productive, more effective virtual and, and metaverse world can drive, right? But, but I am very concerned. I am very concerned about what this means, bringing it back to positive psychology and what we know. I, I'm very concerned about generations of people in our country and eventually the world um, spending time in a virtual world on the couch or in their bed alone, physically alone, putting on something that teleports them psychologically to a different space only to take that off and to rest it down on their bed or on the couch and to not have those meaningful life interactions, those high fives, those hugs, the power of working out together or going to cheer on your favorite team together, right? And as it pertains to leadership, having those really important, meaningful conversations where we grow, where we're looking at someone in the eye across the desk, where we're working on and celebrating what we accomplished uh, in the past month or in the past year. Right, the, the humanity aspect of leadership and of organization building. Um, and I think that we have to ask ourselves some of these questions, right? And so I'll just kind of conclude here by reading you my, my post that I made on the day that my book came out, um, you know, with Willis Duvall here. And, and, I, and I just want to read it out loud because I'm sure some of you probably are on your phones and you probably can't even see it. But right, over the past 15 years, the world has uh, rapidly become more digital. The pace has accelerated at a previously unthinkable speed since March of 2020, when so much of the world went digital, remote, and virtual. There's been a lot said lately about the metaverse, machine learning, AI, self-driving cars, and other technological transformations staring us down. Technology has improved our lives in so many ways. People have written entire books on all the ways the technological advancements have made our lives better. But those advancements have come at a real cost. In Lead Yourself First, Ray Kethledge and I wrote about how the information age has made it harder to think deeply, to focus, and to reflect. In this book, chapter one is entitled Relationships Under Siege for a Reason. Positive psychology research is very clear. The number one driver of life satisfaction is the quality of our social relationships with our family, our friends, our coworkers, teammates, neighbors. And so there is a deeply philosoph uh, philosophical question at hand for everyone today, but especially in the coming years. Are we going to accept the reality that the digital world will become more important than the physical world unless we take deliberate action soon? that our digital lives will become more important than our physical lives. From the dawn of civilization until the invention of TV, almost 100% of our focus was on the physical environment. Computers, iPads, smartphones has taken that way down. And that means we are far less focused on the person right in front of us right now and right next to us. Will we allow smart glasses to enter our lives so that our focus on the people in front of us drops to 20%? All of this is to say that we have big decisions to make in the years ahead as it pertains to how we live and how we lead. In this book, Willis and I make the case that leaders who truly put people first, who care about them and know them beyond their job titles and descriptions and how well they perform are more effective and that they're more needed than ever, All right? So with that, um, we've got 15 minutes or so for Q&A. Would love to hear 
what's on your mind, what resonates, what doesn't resonate, uh, what confuses you, uh, or just any of your thoughts or insights on this entire topic. Hey, Mike, Jonathan Swiegel's here from Traverse City. Um, I'm curious just to hear some of your thoughts on you know, our current situation with the pandemic. And I know a lot of us are school leaders, leaders here and a lot of our staff are feeling overwhelmed and anxious. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on you know, maintaining that high level of expectation and productivity, but at the same point in time, giving people grace mm -hmm. um, in order to, to maintain that relationship, in order to maintain that, that leadership position. Totally. Yeah. This is something that I hear from leaders in, in all different fields, education, business, nonprofit, government, military, you know, really is like, what's the balance between, like you said, high, you know, maintaining expectations for people and empathy, really being able to, you know, so I think that, um, so first of all, I'm not going to give you any, any sort of like, you know, magic pixie dust, unfortunately, you know, this is one that has got, you know, I think everyone, you know, being more uh, philosophical about it. Again, this gets back into leading yourself first about taking time to think through these questions. So step one is if you're asking yourself that question right there, you're, you're already halfway there, right? Because a lot, I think a lot of leaders don't think about that. Um, you know, I think that um, everyone's got, and I heard a great podcast recently with Dr. Michael Gervais talking about the path to mastery is deeply personal, right? And it's different for everyone. Um, based upon where you're at in life, based upon your situation, your challenges. And I think it's really important to know that as a leader, that everybody is going through and is in different situations. Some people are in a chapter of life where they're in a situation where they are ready to row and they're ready to row harder. They're like, hey, like, give me more. Like, I'm finding a ton of fulfillment in my job. And that stress um, is, you know, is not really affecting me. Then there's other people who, like you said, just a lot of them are just like, man, dude, I am like, I'm not literally drowning, but I am, I'm like, figuratively drowning and just like slapping at the water to keep my head above so I can breathe. Right. Um, you know, I think for people who are in that situation that find themselves in that ladder situation, um, you know, I think that, you know, there's a lot of things we do out there and I think that they're intent the best of intentions. I don't think they're making very much a, of a difference. Right. We'll often talk about this idea of like taking like a mental health day. Um, right. Uh, and often people don't even really necessarily know what that means. It just means I'm overwhelmed. I need a break. Right. Um, but my point is that I, I do think that, that that's a totally a band aid solution. Right. And so I think what most people really need, um, you know, is uh, some of the guidance and the support um, uh, about how they can live their lives, you know, uh, uh, in a way that kind of reduces some of, uh, some of the stress factors that are, that are there. Some of it is inevitable, right? You can't do anything about it. Like, but I've talked, and I know Liz McWilliams is on here. Like, she remembers me going, going on record four years ago on this and saying it, but like, there's, I know there's stress and challenge, like when, when people come, especially at principals or at teachers, you know, with like questions and all that. But like, I, I genuinely believe like there's got to be a policy or somewhere where it's like, hey, I'm not checking my email after like a certain time, like eight o'clock, maybe it's eight o'clock at night, maybe it's nine o'clock at night. But like, if you're getting into that business, like uh, of responding to a parent who's frustrated or angry or something like that at like 1030 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, or at 5.30 in the morning. I mean, that is, that is a tough place to be from a well-being standpoint. So I think it goes back to a lot of his, Jonathan, really encouraging people to really, again, this idea of leading yourselves first, of knowing, well, let's, let's stop and be, a, you know, just like a doctor comes in, right? And they often, they, oh, what well, your symptoms? They give you a prescription, right? Like, I think it's really about trying to understand the source, right, of, of the problem. And I think a lot, of, a lot of times people need help identifying, well, what are the sources of stress? What are the top three things that are overwhelming you? Right. Um, and, and, and sometimes just helping people to have that clarity is, is very important. And when you help them have that clarity, um, you know, then they can go, okay, now I can do something about it. Um, right. Hey, okay. It's actually my diet's causing this. Okay. So I need to make some adjustments to my diet. Right. Uh, if it's checking emails, like, you know, like I said, late into the night, and that's like a big source of stress, well, you, you have in your control to change that. And so I do think it is as a leader, if one of our jobs is to help people to understand these things and then help them to, to develop interventions or treatments on themselves, right? Um, and of course, uh, you know, psychologists would call this learning how to do CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy on yourself. How do you talk to yourself about some of these, you know, sources of stress and challenges? But 
Uh, it's a great question and no, no easy middle ground, but I do think it is ultimately we've got to build capacity in people uh, to, to be more effective at, at dealing with the stressors of life because those stressors aren't going anywhere. And I think that very often as leaders, like we want to like put a bandage on, on, on the gunshot wound, right? And that's, that's not going to work. Uh, we've got to really think about more systematic things that we can do to help uh, people to, to proactively address the sources of the chronic stress that they face. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, I know Mike Domagowski is on here, so we're looking yeah. forward to seeing you in December up here in Traverse City. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. I got a question over here. It looks like thoughts on how to get parents on board with this concept. Phones and technology have taken a significant role in parenting. I often feel a minority when trying to promote relationships in real life. Yeah. Uh, yeah, these are these are like like the real like uh, philosophical conundrums of our time. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how much success we have uh, as leaders, as educators, as you know, coaches, whatever, um, in helping people to understand just how deeply problematic it is. Um, you know, you know, when it comes to e even being a parent who's frustrated, who sends that email at ten o'clock at night. You know, um, like. It, it, it is definitely tough, you know, trying to get parents on board with it. I do think that, the, you know, we have obviously P2 for families. I think pushing the, the conversation home, that was a big part of the purpose there, you know, of developing P2 for families is trying to say, hey, this is a way for the schools uh, to suggest to the parents, hey, this might be a good thing for you to have a conversation with, you know, your, your children uh, about. <laughs> but uh, like that still gets, it requires that they actually like open this, you know, you know go to the website and, and participate in it. But um, this, this is an inevitable, a big part of the challenge is that if you don't get others to buy into this or believe into this, then you can only do so much. But one of the, the suggestions I have, that seems like, again, a bit radical, but is when people send emails, right? When they get angry, when they get frustrated, when they do those kinds of things, it's just simply saying, like having a, a canned response, a default response of, Thanks so much for your email. I'd love to meet with you in person and talk about this, right? But going back and forth with email over, you know, going back with people about their frustrations over email, um, it just, it, it almost, not only does it take time and energy, but it also just almost gets nowhere, right? Um, you know, we talked about this in Lead Yourself First, you know, uh, you know, President Lincoln, right? When he was so frustrated with one of his generals, you know, General Meade after the Gettysburg, he wrote like this letter about how angry and how frustrated he was. And, he, and then he stashed it aside and he never sent it. Right, uh, so it's just about this idea of it's it's cathartic to get your ideas out there, but it is not helpful when we communicate when we're angry. Very rarely, I'm not going to say never, right? But rarely what do we communicate when we're angry or frustrated, and we go, yeah, that was good. That was a good. That was a good communication right there, right? Like we usually go, oh man, I wish I could pull that one back. Oh, I wish I didn't say that, but you did, you know. Um, so like it's one of those things. I think you try to really push people to to meet with you in person, because as we know, people are, are a lot less tough, right? Uh, when they're in person than when they're behind a keyboard, right? And you get them in person and now you can have a more productive conversation nine times out of 10. The expectation of continuous accessibility is definitely an ongoing challenge for school leaders. Yeah, the, the Liz saying that, I mean, you and I talked about that, right? Like uh, many years ago, and I think it's, it's only gotten worse as the world has, has moved even more virtual, but you know, Liz's point that she made was like, sometimes things happen and they're time sensitive. And if you don't respond, then it goes on, a, you know, a, you know, a chat room or on Facebook or whatever. Now the problem is like five times bigger, you know, um, and then you got to deal with that. So I totally understand like the, the multiple perspectives on it. Um, my big thing is I, I think that we just have to set expectations for parents. Um, and I, and I know there's all kinds of stressors around this and all kinds of, you know, like stuff happening across the country about what is the role of parents in education. And, but I'll tell you, I think that, um, you know, we can set the expectations that if there's a challenge, if there's an observation, if there's a frustration, like understand that we want to solve it together. Um, and so let's find a way to come together, right. And to try to find common ground. And, and while that might seem Pollyanna or might seem a little ideological, uh, I, I think it's actually doable. Um, you know, and if that becomes your default and you just commit to not battling back and forth with people on email, um, or allowing that email to like beat you down and hang over your head, then I, I think you set the, the table for, you know, being a more effective leader and coming up with more effective solutions to your problems and challenges. Other questions?
Five more minutes if we need it. Hey, Mike, in terms of setting expectations for, for schools, um, there's different levels and you've talked about parents, but then there's also students. So it's really setting this culture. So can you just talk about setting expectations in these complex environments? Yeah. Um, so tying this to relationships right off the bat into the P2 mission, you know, the phrase that, you know, we've often used that you've probably heard a lot is like, is the relationship ecosystem, right? So there's, you know, there's administrators and the counselors and teachers and students and parents. And sometimes the parents, obviously they interact with their kids. And then they also interact with like their teachers or the administrators, the administrators, you know, interact with the teacher. So there's this whole like, you know, sort of fluid ongoing set of, of exchanges that happen right? Um, in, in these different ways. Um, yeah, I, I think that, again, like all these questions, which have been great, like there's no clean answer here. There's no like, you know, hey, what's two plus two, Mike? Yeah, you know, I must ask me that question, right? Like, um, like all the questions are very, which is good. I mean, like, this is the complexity of all of it. You know, I think, you know, some of the expectations, you know, with people about the complexity in the system, um, you know, it, you first have to own and, and accept the reality that it's messy. Yeah. And I think that that's like starting, like that's the starting line. Um, and I think often like we wish for, we wish the messiness away or we wish that it was just a lot cleaner. And we spend a lot of our time wishing or hoping for things that are essentially not realistic, um, especially in the world today where there's just so much ongoing, you know, communications, um, so I think to me, like that's, it starts with like, what is your, your baseline foundation that, that accepts the complexity of the situation and the messiness of it. And very much that we're talking humans. And I said this before life is, you know, when I was interviewed earlier, life is what complicated, like, um, and as soon as you start with that, right, all of a sudden when now, like when friction pops up or when issues pop up, you're like, yeah, it's life. You know what I mean? Like, and, and you don't, you don't allow it to sit there and just like, feel like you're just like, boom, just getting hammered up against the ropes. You know, um, you know, it's just, it's just that awareness that like, it's going to be challenging. Um, and so once you start with that, that, that is why I, I kind of preach this message over and over again about how important it is to start with that understanding, right? And after you get, you know, past that, that understanding, you know, I, I think the, the big, big thing boils into a lot of times is how do we allow ourselves to acknowledge the friction, acknowledge the problems and the challenges, but not to ruminate and obsess on it. Right. Because I, I hear this from so many people and I won't ask for a show of hands here, but like how many of us ruminate, right? We get feedback or someone says something and we sit there and we just let it just eat this chip away at our soul. Like they just, it eats us up and we're like, oh, I can't believe he said that about me. I can't believe she did that. You're like, you know, like, and uh, I mean, I recently got some feedback from some of the people that I lead, like you sit there and if you start to internalize it and you allow your brain to obsess on it and go, can't believe it. Is that true? Is that really true? Oh my goodness. Like, right. Like the, the self-talk that you start providing that, that inner my, that inner dialogue in your brain, you know, you know, Dr. Michael Gervais calls, you know, like that's the source of confidence. It's also the source of great stress and a lot of mental health challenges, right. Is how quickly can we, can we flush those thoughts from, from our minds? It's not saying that you should be like delusional and pretend that the, 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 the feedback or the, the criticism or the issues don't exist. But if you ruminate on them and you and you latch onto them and you hold on to them, yeah, it's going to beat you up. It's gonna it's gonna crush you. It's gonna crush your energy. It's gonna crush you know crush your motivation. Uh, it's gonna hurt your ability to be present with people because you're gonna be like, you know, think your mind's gonna be elsewhere instead of present, you know, with your family or your friends. So uh, much easier said than done. But I think a lot of it has to do you know, with, you know, some of those challenges that, that we have gotten really good at, at holding on to thoughts. And so the, the antidote to that is this whole concept of mindfulness, right? And some of you probably have heard of this or you practice this, like, I'm not a huge meditator, but I do like micro meditations of like two minutes and I just sit there and I like, and I just, all I do is because that's about as long as I can go before my, my mind starts racing again. But like, you literally focus on your breath, right? And if you can focus on nothing more than just breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out for two minutes, you give your brain almost like a bit of like a, like a, a reset button, right? You give your brain like a little bit of chance to put it all down and go, okay. It doesn't mean you come in totally refreshed, but hopefully you've been able to flush out because what's literally happening in your brain, neurological connections, billions of them are coming together and telling you, this is a really big deal. What she said about you is a really big deal and you should be concerned about it. 
right? And so you've got to be able to give your, your scientifically speaking, neurologically, right? You've got to be able to give your, your brain the chance to get rid of that stuff so that you can focus on the other people and the other tasks at hand, right? Again, easier said than done, but these are some of the things that you can do by practicing micro meditations or, you know, being, being really mindful and not allowing your mind to ruminate on the past or obsess and worry about the future. All right, last thing here. Um, comments on that. I know we're about up on time, but you know, I love when you talk about management versus leadership and relationships. School leaders are constantly grappling with doing things right versus doing the right things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, I think that, you know, the reality is management uh, does not really focus much on relationships. Management is much more transactional. It's much more like, hey, I'm managing this process. Your job is to do this. Your job is to do that. My job is to make sure that you know what's going on here, and that this happens first, and then this happens, and this happens. Um, I don't know. I don't honestly, I don't know how, because you can inspire people without a relationship. You can show them like a motivational talk, like from David Goggins or, you know, like someone to come in and someone can come in and speak and, and fill you up with energy and inspiration. Apollo Ono is a great motivational speaker, right? You, you can have those people for sure. Um, but for the most part, relation, inspiration comes from the relationships you build with people, not wanting to let one another down and having aspirations of what you can do in the future and how you can work hard together and how you can, you, know, you can accomplish something and make a big impact on people's lives. That's, that's where majority of inspiration comes from. And I think the, the best, most effective, yet not the fastest way is through our relationships. And that when we build relationships, right, it allows us to tap into the capacity to inspire other people to be their best, to do their very best, right, as often as possible. So... And then Brian, love the idea of relationships at work being a huge attention factor. Seems um, often, but overlooked. Absolutely. I mean, spot on like that. That's a big part of it. You know, we know like when you got those relationships there, people are willing to be loyal, you know, to their leader and to one another, um, you know, and that allows you to endure the hard times. Because guess what? Inevitably, you're in an organization. It's not all sunny, right? If it is, then you're not doing it right. You're not pushing hard enough. You're not, right? Life is hard and it's going to get hard at times. Uh, and so those relationships are, are essential, right, to get through those hard times, right? Relationships are very often the foundation of resilience. All right. Well, uh, it was great to see everybody. Uh, Jeff, back over to you, if anything else to close it out with. But appreciate everyone's time today. Hopefully uh, you took away a couple of ideas and thoughts from the conversation that, uh, you, uh, that stick with you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Mike. And, and just um, one more thing. Mike mentioned P2 for Families. We also have parent letters that are part of this new toolbox. So again, setting expectations, being able to communicate upstream of issues with parents about P2 that's available now, if anyone's interested. Um, with that, Elizabeth, I'll let you close it out. Yeah, Mike, thank you so much for that awesome talk. It's always so good to hear from you. And I always walk away inspired myself. So hopefully um, the rest of the listeners and everyone who took the time out of your day on a Thursday, we know how busy you are. So we appreciate you showing up and hopefully you can walk away with some talking points. Um, this will be sent, the recording will be sent so you can share with colleagues or anything like that um, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Thanks Take Mike. Care.